Good morning, everyone. We will start the Agricultural Committee. And uh, do we have a motion to unanimously approve the minutes, Mr. Leonard? Mr. Five seconds. Roll call. Uh, I, I didn't put roll call. <laughs> okay, roll call first. Brown. Brown here. Braz. Braz here. Copy. Copy here. Oh. Leonard. Leonard here. Sanchez. Allen. Allen present. Good morning. Kenyon. Here. I was afraid Allen wasn't going to be here this morning. So. Okay. Now, why we would, them why, would, you, why would you say that, you darling? I, I knew you would be here. <laughs> so we need a uh, unanimous approval of the minutes from March 17th made by. So Mr. moved by Leonard, Mr. Mr. Fraz. Any, dis any disapproval? No disapproval. They're approved. Is there public comment? No public. Oh, we have public. We have talk about our partners. Mr. Steve Arnold from the Farm Bureau. Good morning. Good morning. A um, few things to uh, report on um, this morning. Um, first of all, uh, just a little bit about the General Assembly wrap up. Uh, the Farm Bureau had a, a few bills uh, where it had success in the uh, General Assembly. One was uh, a biodiesel sales tax incentive uh, that transitions the state sales tax incentive uh, for B11 uh, to blends up to B20 over a period of um, well, period of four years. Um, so that was something that, that we were really um, pleased to see that the uh, General Assembly acted on. Uh, a second one was an Industrial Biotech Partnership Act, uh, which creates a public-private partnership and dedicated state funding uh, through the DCEO um, to make grants for future bi biotechnology research um, and, and try to put Illinois back in the position uh, to be one of the leading states in terms of uh, biotechnology research. Um, one, one of our state legislative priorities that we failed to achieve this year in the, the General Assembly uh, was an extension or an expansion of agritourism liability. Um, to uh, to make it um, easier to, for farmers uh, that whose whose livings whose activities on farm are essential uh, to the growth of their business uh, to limit their liability um, for visitors coming to the farm. Unfortunately, we were not happy or we're not successful in getting that passed. Uh, so we'll come back as one of our legislative priorities, both in the veto session and uh, if we don't have any luck in the veto session again next year. Um, a couple of, uh, couple of highlights of uh, what was included in the, uh, the tax package that's kind of applicable, ac applicable, easy for you to say. Say it five times. That's right. Um, <laughs> One is a grocery tax holiday. Uh, the 1% state sales tax on grocery items will be suspended from July 1 of this year to July 1 of next year. And um, a second is the automatic uh, CPI increase in the motor fuel tax at 2.2 cents per gallon will be suspended for one year. Um, one other thing of note, um, on farmers markets permit, um, the General Assembly did pass uh, legislation that would allow statewide permitting for farmers that wish to sell meat, dairy, poultry, and certain pre-frozen foods at farmers markets. Um, so that will be a statewide permit as opposed to a county by county permit. And uh, we expect to learn more about that in, in the coming months. Um, in other news, um, we concluded our 16th annual Farm City Open House uh, Touch a Tractor last week. 
uh, actually on, on the, the uh, 10th of April, we added a couple of new things to that um, event this year. One was a legislative meet and greet. Um, little did we know that when we planned that for Saturday evening, April 9th, that the General Assembly would adjourn at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning, April 9th. Uh, so we had some tired legislators come in and visit with our members that evening, but we were very pleased to see them. Uh, we also did our first Easter egg hunt, and the jury's still out on the Easter egg hunt. Um, but th the kids definitely enjoyed it. Um, my staff and I uh, made farm safety presentations to uh, K through eight grades last week at Hinkley Big Rock Schools. Um, we are moving forward with a proposed prairie pollinator rain garden um, as an environmental and water quality improvement on our property on Randall Road. <clears throat> Excuse me. We hope to engage NCAP uh, Incorporated uh, for the design and build of, of that feature. Um, next month, we will announce 15 scholarship winners. Um, we will elect directors. And I can't read my notes. No, oh, and we will have the first of six monthly drive through barbecue fundraisers uh, for our not-for-profit foundation. So the second Thursday of every month, we will do drive through barbecue, pork chop, and chicken dinners at the Farm Bureau. So don't make dinner plans. That concludes my report. Are there any questions of Mr. Arnold? I, I, I just have a comment. Yes. Uh, I went to the pork chop dinner, and um, those are some of the best pork chops I've had. And my uh, even my granddaughter said, "Boy, Grandma, these are really good." <laughs> so, Hard to please a granddaughter, <laughs> so that's a good. They were, and, they were well pleased. And then, um, well, that was a self help program. The 4-H uh, had their pork chop dinner to raise money for their programs, and we all like to see self help. Seeing Madam Chairwoman to my left reminds me that. Uh, we also made a gift um, to the county of eight or eight or ten uh, farm prints um, that we hope to see gracing the halls of uh, King County's administrative buildings. Um, we didn't go so far as to provide frames, but we, but we did provide uh, some local artwork. Of uh, we have to tape them to scenes. the wall then. <laughs> <laughs> we will provide tape. Yes. <laughs> We will make sure that, um, unlike the maps, uh, they <laughs> they will be properly framed and put up on the walls appropriately. And they are truly lovely. Um, if you'd like to see them, they're on the bench uh, as you walk into the hallway upstairs uh, in the uh, is that the in the floor. inner sanctum? It it is in the sanctum of work behind locked doors. <laughs> I, I want to comment on your touch of tractor. That was a perfect. We had perfect weather two of the days. And just all those families, little kids climbing on tractors and play, playing, it was, it's pretty cool. Uh, um, now, Northern uh, Illinois Mr. Food Bank. What? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, could Mr. Arnold uh, give the dates, the, the regular, the recurring dates for the pork chop barbecue? I, I do not have them in front of me, but it is the oh, second yeah. Thursday of every month. There we go. I was thinking Tuesday, but that sounded wrong. So second Thursday. Thank you. All right. Um, now we'll have something from Northern Illinois. Tracy? Yes. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. So because I haven't been on here to, to update before, uh, please forgive me if I'm if I'm giving too much or too little information and then we can go from there for next meeting. But um, so just a little update about the work that we're doing here and what we're seeing. Um, over the last three months, we're serving, we've been serving through our network partners, um, an average of 375,000 neighbors. Um, that is a duplicated number. So people who come back like maybe multiple times within a month. Um, but it's still a 25% increase from the beginning of the fiscal year, which was last summer for us. Um, so we are seeing the impacts of um, 
the increase in inflation and costs of food and fuel um, causing a financial strain on our neighbors. Uh, so we're already seeing that, that increase and we're expecting it to continue. Um, one of our biggest challenges is continues to be having enough of the nutritious food and the variety of food that our neighbors want and need. Um, our government food has declined. So from, from we had an, an estimated, we had about 34 million meals last year and this year, so this fiscal year, which is goes from July 1st to June 30th, um, this year we're estimating it's going to come in around 7 million. So from 34 million to 7 million, um, it's a pretty big decrease. Um, and so we're struggling to make up for that. We've invested more in purchased food. Um, we're, we're about doubling our investment from the pre, from pre-pandemic and it will, and our purchased food will end up being about 25% of our distribution from, for this year. Um, let's see if there's anything, you know, of course, just like everything else, truckload costs have, have increased, increased and the actual cost of the purchased food has increased as well. Um, and then the other things we're kind of keeping an eye on are um, the, the, the SNAP benefits. So the, the, with the public health emergency being extended for the next, for three months from April 16th, that means that um, SNAP emergency allotments will continue at least through that time. Um, and once that public health emergency is declared over, there are, I think it's 30 days um, until the emergency SNAP allotments will end. So that means people will no longer be getting the full, um, the full, the maximum amount of SNAP benefits that, that they can get. Um, and so we will expect at that point to see an inc a further increase in the number of neighbors we're serving and people who are coming to um, food pantries for the first time. Um, the other things that are kind of on our radar that we're paying attention to and um, advocating for are around TFAP, so the Emergency Food Assistance Program. Um, we're, we're trying to find out why so many loads are being canceled and, and what other food banks and, and providers are experiencing. Um, we are asking for continued increase in the amount of money um, being allocated for TFAP so that we can help make up for that, the, the food that we're missing, um, that we were not able to get through donations and um, through other previous government um, commodities. So uh, TFAP continues to be high on our priority list for, for advocating for more funding for that program. Um, and also leading up to the farm bill, we're paying attention to um, TFAP and SNAP and different marker bills that are that are floating around leading up to that and trying to get um, kind of our, we're advocating for uh, increases to SNAP in different ways and changes to SNAP programming in different ways, but, um, but keeping TFAP and SNAP at the top of our list of things that we're concerned about. I think that's the gist of what probably is appropriate that, that needs to be shared here that everybody on this call might be interested in. Um, child nutrition is also something that we're, we're also keeping a close eye on. Child nutrition waivers are ending in, uh, in June, and so that will affect the number of kids that we can serve, um, but we're working to advocate for that as for an extension of those waivers as well. So I'm hoping that I've covered the sorts of things that the food bank would normally cover and please feel free to share feedback now or later if there's something that I'm missing or that, that you'd like to see me update on. Are there any questions, Madam Chairman? Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that the SNAP benefits are going to be reduced. Um, I didn't write down the exact date, but you also in that when you're talking about SNAP, that the benefits are, when um, they end, they're actually gonna be reduced in the amount of SNAP benefits a family can receive is? Yes, so, so the way, when people qualify for SNAP, they qualify based on income and number of um, family members. And so there's, there's a whole, uh, it's 
like a whole chart or matrix of how what what they're entitled to. But right now, because of the emergency um, order, everyone is receiving in Illinois is receiving emer the emergency maximum allotment. So it's the most you can receive for a for a four family household or a five family household or whatever it is that that they are. Um, so that will be reduced back down to what they would traditionally be qualified for, per, like when it's there's not an emergency order in place. So there so it will be so it's what they are um, entitled to during non-pandemic times. Um, but it will be a, an adjustment for a lot of family members who have been relying on that to help be able to not spend money on food or as much money on food so they can use that fund, those funds for other payments that they're, that they need to make. If that makes, so, I hope that makes sense. Is that going to be a sliding scale then for a family of four or five? So it all depends. So a family of four or five who qualifies for SNAP, so they might receive what, I, I don't know the, the minimum, I can't think of right now, the minimum amount that they would qualify for, but um, if they were qualified for uh, $150 a month previously, and now they're getting whatever that maximum allotment is, I don't know what that is either. Um, I don't have the scale in front of me, but let's say that was that's three hundred and fifty dollars. So they'll go back down to that one hundred and fifty. But another family of four might might have a lower total income, and so they'll go. They'll have a higher um, benefit. So maybe two hundred and fifty. So right now, all of them are getting the three fifty, but they'll they'll go down to the two fifty. If that makes sense. Uh, yes, thank you. And then, what about the child benefits? You said those are ending in June. Child waiver, um, the child waiver for some of the, the feeding programs for after school and summer programs, and as well as the national school lunch program, some of the waivers around um, how we're able to feed kids. So during the pandemic, we've been, we've been able to give families, for example, um, they've been able to come pick up multiple meals at one time so that if the parents are working and they can't make it to a, pro, a feeding program, um, so some of those waivers are coming to an end, but we're working with the USDA and the state on trying to figure out which waivers. Apparently there is a possibility to extend some if they don't cost any money. So it's, if it's, it doesn't cost necessarily any more money to feed somebody multiple meals up to give somebody multiple meals at once, um, then there's a possibility that the state can apply for that waiver and, and still be able to do that. So um, that was just kind of, that was a, a brand new update yesterday that these waivers, that there's the possibility for Illinois to apply for one of those extensions, as long as it doesn't have a monetary value attached to it. All right. Thank you. We have a question from the audience too. Over there at the podium. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Um, Michelle from Glory Gardens, non for profit. I wanted to ask what food you guys are lacking most of. You said you guys are kind of figuring out where you have um, lack of food. What is that food in particular, if you could? Um, so we're always lacking protein. <laughs> we're always looking for more protein and having to purchase more protein than we would normally. Um, we spend 35% um, of our of our food purchasing budget on produce, 30% on protein and 15% on dairy. So, um, so those are the areas where we don't get as many donations um, and with costs being higher, they're, they're harder to, it, our money goes, doesn't go as far as it used to. So does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Did I understand you said that You'd serve 4 million meals last year, and you think you're going to serve 7 million this year? Um, it was, so last year, 34 million meals. 34. Came, the, that, not that we served, but that came from, through government food. So it came through different government programs. And this year, the government food is accounting for seven. We, we expect it to account for about 7 million of the meals that we're serving. Last year, we served 100 million meals in the fiscal year. Um, we're not, we're not planning to, we're not trying to, and we're not on track to serve that many this year. Um, where I think we were aiming for around 80 million and we might fall short of that. Um, but of, of those meals, 34 million came through government assistance. And this year we're at, we're, we're looking at about 7 million of those meals. 
Mr. Chairman, can I follow up on that? This is Alan. This is Alan. Uh, Tr Tracy, do you have any idea why that is? Why would the feds not be interested in keeping the food flowing to our food banks across the country? So one piece of it comes from the um, COVID emergency boxes. So they were giving out these those fresh produce boxes um, previously that did come to an end. Um, and but but out of that came still sort of a supply of fresh produce that was coming through TFAP, the, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, which has been around for a long time. Um, so so part of it was just that the COVID era, the COVID area, uh, COVID um, emergency food boxes ended. That was meant to be temporary. Um, and part of it is we're having we're seeing a lot of canceled orders through that emergency food program. We're trying to work with the USDA. I was on a call yesterday um, trying to figure out why so many orders are being canceled. I mean, part of it has to do with the same thing as everybody else is dealing with supply chain issues. And part of it has to do with um, farmers are being offered more money for some of their food from other sources. So then the farmers end up canceling the orders, which then leads to the um, USDA having to cancel the orders that we've the food banks have placed. Um, so, so there are a variety of reasons, um, and and TFAP is underfunded. Uh, so that just comes from arguments across across the aisle about what the funding should be spent on. Thanks, Tracy. It's just further evidence that you know you toss a pebble in a pond and it goes in places you never know. Yeah. Thank you. I just can't imagine how bad it would be if we didn't have people like you and, and Ms. Durate here to, trying to help those in need. We, we, would, we would really be in deep trouble. Yes, yes, we're so grateful. I mean, we've, we've, we've seen a lot of donors step up to help contribute, which has been great. We know for the long term, we can't keep up this pace with donations and also with having to purchase so much food. Um, but, but yes, right now we're grateful that we have so much help to be able to do that. Thank, well, thank you. you for the work you both do, but now we'll have the uh, Michelle Durate who's going to speak about uh, Batavia Community Garden. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Durate and I founded a non-for-profit called Glory Gardens. Um, I also have a business that is um, Garden Jargon that is a for-profit business where I help consult people for setting up gardens because so many people say they love to garden, they just don't know how. So I do have a slideshow that Mr. Peters is going to help me with. Oh, all right. Um, I, this is my first time with a presentation with a slideshow, so bear with me and I'm going to speak fast. Um, this is the... Um, I went through a, a bad rough season in my life back in 2018, and I kind of turned my faith back to Christ and tried to figure out what I was supposed to be doing and what my goals were in life and what I, what my purpose was. And I truly heard the words of Christ say to me, grow food and feed people. And I had no idea what that meant. And I was renting a house in Aurora. So since my landlord was in Aurora or in Georgia, I tilled my front yard because I'm one that asks or begs for, for forgiveness instead of asking for permission. So I put this garden in my front yard and I just started growing food and putting it in bags and feeding my neighbors. So my neighbor told me that there was a um, down the street, that's the garden a little bit later, there was a garden down the street that was a community garden, maybe you should get a plot over there. So I went down to that community garden, which was actually Marie Wilkinson Food Pantry's garden. This is right there on Highland in Aurora. That's across the street from their food pantry. It's very much more developed now at this point. But I spoke to the founder of that garden and he said, we have no more space because all of the spaces that you can rent were taken, which told me there was a need for that. And cause I wasn't allowed to play in his garden. So I need to go make my other ones. So I asked my church, Ginger Creek Church on Butterfield Road in Aurora if I could have some of their land because they did have 15 acres and they said yes. So I put in 2019, 
I put a 40 by 40 garden in there. And out of that garden, we grew over 860 pounds of food that was donated directly to Marie Wilkinson Food Pantry. Um, that garden has since tripled in size. This is the tail end of that garden now where that black tarp is. That's where we are killing off the grass to do another no-till method where that garden now reaches 125 feet by 45 feet. And we grew over, let's see, 1,567 pounds in there last year. We're projected to do over 2,500 pounds of food this year. That garden at Ginger Creek actually feeds 40 families in Ginger Creek Church, as well as the rest of the produce goes to Marie Wilkinson Food Pantry. We are her second largest produce producer, which I'm so very proud of. And I, trust me, I, if I had an hour, I'd be able to announce everybody's names that helped me because I couldn't do it without them. I can't do it without help. And I can't do it without people help me. So I'm sorry I get emotional. We need a little emotion here. I know. <laughs> when I lived in Aurora, I then moved to Batavia off of Wilson. And I told my landlord, I would love to live on your property, but if you don't give me that yard for food, I can't do it. And he said, yes. So I turned my yard in that property into a 40 by 40 garden, which you see I'm putting the cardboard down to kill off the grass, as well I do a no-till method here. And I turned it into this. That is another food forest that I have on my property. I don't know what I was thinking last year, but I did not weigh anything that came out of that garden. But I have three cabinets in my basement that tell you that that food was produced through canning as what I do with the food. And then any extra that I can't produce and process myself, I donate to Batavia Interfaith Food Pantry. Um, when I moved onto that property in Wilson, I knew that they had had a community garden in Batavia once before. And so I got on Facebook and I asked if anybody knew where the community garden was because I wanted to grow more food in addition to that Wilson property. And everybody had their own opinions about it. And I said, forget it, I'm just gonna do it myself. And so I posted on Facebook that I was gonna do a community garden. Who wants to join me? And 25 people showed up at my house in the middle of March last year. And they asked where the garden was and I didn't know. So I prayed about it and a woman messaged me and said, we just um, purchased a home and it was all an act of God of how we got this home. And we have five acres of land. If you'd like to come by, maybe you can use our land for this community garden. This is the property. This is on Hart Road. It's at the address of 1501 Hart Road in Batavia. And I took this empty plot of land with the help of all of our volunteers. We cut sod out of there because it used to be horse pasture. So you can stick a bamboo stake in the ground up to six inches without resistance. That's how fertile the soil was. And then we had um, the Aurora girls soccer team come and they rolled it and they called it the ho-ho field because it looked like ho-hos all over this field. We got on Facebook and asked everybody to come collect this sod from us. And we had cars down the street lined up to take the sod out of here. And in place of that, we then put down cardboard again, got tons of donations of wood chips and mulch and horse manure. And we built this garden. Home Depot from Home Depot has a team depot that helps local communities in helping with projects like this. And they had a big team of people came out and helped us one day. We are also a reuser, recycler, and repurposer. That's lumber that I found in driveways of people's houses that I knocked on their door and asked them for their lumber because we build our garden beds out of that. And I would rather it not be burned and rather be repurposed. These water tanks were donated to us 
so that we can allow more water to be given to us here at the garden. We are on well water at the community garden. And I'm sorry, the community garden grew over 937 pounds of food last year that went to Batavia Interfaith Food Pantry. Our goal this next year for Batavia um, Interfaith Food Pantry is 1,500 pounds. That's an increase of 500 pounds. We have problems with the city trying to help us fill these water tanks. I have not really pursued it hard enough, but one day I prayed about it again because we were in a drought and I was scared we were going to empty the well for this homeowner and an Aloha pool truck water tanker went in front of me one day and I thought that was a sign from God. So I'm calling him and he returned my phone call and said, I'll fill your tanks for free. So we were able to fill those tanks a couple times last year. Oh, yeah. Those are the rakes from all of our community. We had a huge project and we don't even own rakes. So I got on Facebook and asked our community, who can I borrow your rakes from? And they gave me addresses. So that's just an important photo for me to know that our community wants to help. They gave us their rakes to use and then I returned them after we used them for the project. Baskets, we use those. We use those, recycle them for the plants that we grow. We get tree services, donate the chips for us. Walmart gives us the boxes so we can take produce to the pantry. Compost comes from Wayne. We have tree services help us transport that. Every plant that's in all four of my gardens are grown in my basement. I have a grow room. Um, right now, I think I counted them last week with my nieces. We're up to 2,700 plants. They go in all of the gardens, as well as I do sell them to recoup some of the money from what I paid to, to grow them. This is my wonky setup in my backyard because I don't have a greenhouse. So I make do with what I can. And more plants. Another wonky setup. Those got shredded from the wind last year. Excuse me, I do get emotional and I can't talk about this without bringing God into it. So I apologize if I offend anybody, but he is my creator. I was featured in the Batavia Magazine because of this story last season, Daily Herald and NBC5 came out to interview us. That's Leanne Trotter. Um, we were on NBC5 last year as well. Um, that's the aerial shot of my garden at my house. That is Ginger Creek's garden. And just imagine another third of that extended for this year. And then that is the Batavia Community Garden. There are rental plots in there, as well as a 40 by 50 plot that is specifically donated to the Marie Wilkinson Food Pantry, or I'm sorry, Batavia Community Garden. Glory Gardens is my non-for-profit. Garden Jargon's my consultant business. Batavia Community Garden is who we give all that good stuff to. So quickly on my notes, I know I'm running out of time. Um, out of all four of those gardens, I grow over 15,000 square feet of growing space. And I could not do it without the volunteers and the help that we have. Um, we grew over 2,500 pounds of food in 2021 that was donated directly to Ginger Creek families, Batavia Community Garden, or I'm sorry, Batavia Interfaith Food Pantry and Marie Wilkinson Food Pantry. Um, I just set up the non-for-profit this year, so we haven't had any financial donations. Everything has come from um, marketplace, finding things online for free, picking the garbage on garbage day. <laughs> we just do what we can to make things work. Um, my goals for next year, obviously, is grow more food. That's, that's all I can think of is growing more food. And I'm kind of an addict when it comes to gardens, so I'll find more land and grow more food. Um, I want to start a Batavia Community Garden West. I've spoken to a couple owners um, that own some property on the west side of Batavia, and I'd like to duplicate what we did on the east side to the west side um, for next year. I also spoke to a gentleman that owns five acres of property right off of Kirk Road that wants to donate that to me, and he made me promise <laughs> that I do that for profit 
because he couldn't believe all that I do without making a profit. And I'm okay with that because I know the good Lord will take care of me. Um, we're just looking for, like I'm a one man show. So I don't know how to write grants. I don't know how to ask for donations. Like I said, I just set up my accounts for um, donations. I just set up a bank account. I don't know all that logistics part of the side, that side, but I do know how to grow food. And I do know how to help people with the food that they need or even how to grow it. So for support, support wise, we're looking always for more volunteers that can come out and help us. Um, anybody that knows how to work with um, grants or how we can write for grants, that would be awesome. If anybody knows somebody with a truck, like I could really use a truck. <laughs> <laughs> the good Lord says, if you can't, if you can't afford it, or if you can't ask for it, you can't, you don't deserve it. And I think I deserve it because <laughs> I have a little Chevy cruise and I will put eight foot boards in there. I don't care. I'll pop a wheelie all the way home. Um, and then um, just maybe I can even talk to the city with the fire departments and stuff to help us fill those water tanks so that we can um, water all that produce at the Batavia Community Garden. So I'd be happy to open for questions if anybody has any. <clears throat> Mr. Chair Brown here with a question or a comment. Thank Hi. You. Thank you so much. Mr. Yes, Chair, sir. This, yeah, thank you. You know, I just want to say that you do a wonderful job and, and I appreciate your emotion. Thank you. It, uh, I go by your uh, plot on Heart Road quite often. And I, I, it's amazing the work that I see getting done there all the time or having been done. I don't know when you guys do it because there's never anybody there when I go by, but <laughs> one of these days I'm going to run into you over there. Um, and I, I, I wanted to mention to you a couple ideas I have for you. Maybe you could also give us all your phone numbers so we can get a hold of you. Um, but um, there is a piece of property over on, Wils on, on Main Street at, at Water that at one time was a community garden. The property is owned by Batavia Enterprise and he donated that property to the community to use as a community garden. I'd be happy to reach out to Mr. Dempsey and talk to him to see if you know he'd be willing to do that again. I think he would be if you're interested in that. And then also um, as far as the water, I'm quite certain I can make a phone call to the city and we could get their public works department to fill up your water tanks. I appreciate that. No problem. Would you mind, you know, reaching out with, the, could you give us your phone number so we could reach out to you? Yes, there's a slide with my number on it. And I do understand that property. Um, when I did post that on Facebook back last year in, in February and March, everybody mentioned that property on Water Street. And I believe the, somebody rezoned that property to where you could not grow agriculture on it. And that's why people had to pull out of that opportunity. And so that's why people were like, there's a need for it, we need it. And so it, I think it was a zoning thing as to why that stopped, because there's no reason that a, a community garden should have crumbled like that. Yeah, I could look into that for you. I appreciate it. And Blair, I, I didn't get the slide presentation. Um, I don't know why I wasn't able to pull that up as it was going through. So if somehow or another somebody could send me the, this fine lady's uh, phone number, I'd appreciate it. If you want to write it down, I can tell you now. Sure. I'm ready. I, um, if I may, why don't we do that offline? Okay. Uh, just to protect your. We could put that on the business line county's no, uh, website. It's on the agenda packet. Uh, yeah. It got gotcha. always better to in, attend in person, Mr. Brown. <laughs> well, if I if I wasn't just getting at the tail end of my COVID experience, which I wouldn't recommend to anyone, I would have been there, Mr. Kenyon. You know that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get it to you, Dave. Not to I got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Stop by anytime. I'm in the blue Chevy Cruze. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Janice Hill. Uh, congratulations on everything you've Thank done. You. And you know that uh, Matt and I write grants, and so we're absolutely um, thrilled to help you. I will say also, um, as far as uh, Hoop House, which would be fantastic for several of your sites, you are eligible for federal funds now that you're a not-for-profit. So yeah. we could help you with that. And then probably some other infrastructure. Those are equip dollars through the federal program. So we can help walk you through that as well. And there are other 
grant resources. And then if you can, if you can stay for the rest of the presentations, we're going to talk about an upcoming grant as no well problem. that you'd be eligible it. for. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. And I, Thank you, you're, you're getting some help here. I, appreciate I have a water tank too. I could deliver water to you. It's only a thousand gallons, so. <laughs> I'll take it all. <laughs> um, LA Farmers Market, it's Janie Maxwell. There she Good is. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be back and uh, present for all of you. I wanted to bring you a brief update on the Illinois Farmers Market Association. Um, I am the ex part-time executive director, and I think there are some new people in the room. Um, I used to work as a consultant for King County Local Food and also for the Making Cane Fit for Kids program. So um, it's good to be back. Next slide. This is a picture of some of what ILFMA, the Illinois Farmers Market Association, uh, has been up to. Uh, we are a membership organization. We are an umbrella. We don't run farmers markets, but we instead provide resources and help for farmers markets across the state of Illinois. Uh, we are one of the few states in the nation to actually certify farmers market managers and put them through an extensive continuing education program so that they are up to date on some of the best practices for farmers markets. Uh, we rely on thousands of hours of volunteer help, and um, you'll notice the one number that's missing from this slide is the number of farmers markets in Illinois, and that's because farmers markets are hard to pin down, and um, we're not exactly sure how many there are, but we think there are over 330 or so farmers markets here in Illinois. Next. Um, this is our mission statement. As I said, we were started 10 years ago with the mission of creating um, education and training for farmers markets. Uh, 10 years ago, there was an increasing number of farmers markets being formed across the state. And the second thing that we were challenged with was to increase the number of farmers markets that accepted the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, program for uh, link users here in Illinois. Uh, we do a lot of professional development and training. We've been very fortunate to partner with the Illinois Farm Bureau. Uh, we are part of the Live Local Food and Farm Market uh, Conference that the Farm Bureau puts on annually. Uh, Farm Bureau has helped us provide webinars that are basic to the everyday needs of farmers market managers. And then, as I mentioned, this certification course uh, that goes quite extensively through what it means to be a farmer's markets and what those best practices are. Each farmer's market is unique in Illinois. It's as unique as the community that hosts it. Our goal is not to make farmer's market cookie cutters, but instead to equip farmer's markets and their operators to take their market to the next level of excellence that they see uh, for their own farmer's market. Um, we also are fortunate to have a grant from the Illinois Department of Agriculture where we're offering farmer's market 101 where we're trying to get new and beginning farmers market managers up to speed on what are some of the ins and outs of running a farmers market. We really, um, again, really our goal is to support farmers markets, but we also understand that farmers markets are a part of the local food system. They're a significant part of the local food system. And so we work with partners across the state to ensure that um, farmers markets have a significant role in the local food system. As I mentioned, at the state level, we work with the Illinois uh, Farm Bureau. We are working with Feeding Illinois, Illinois Farm Bureau, and uh, University of Illinois Extension um, on um, the Farm to Food Bank project, taking what is considered probably produce and product that is unharvested, left in the field, that is still usable, and working with farmers markets to create systems to bring that product to market and push it out into the um, food insecure uh, network. Maybe it's through pantries or food banks across the state. 
not leaving that food to go to waste, but instead creating an income stream for farmers uh, to be able to participate in that opportunity. Farmers are generous. We find them donating their product, but this is also an opportunity to increase a market channel uh, for farmers with product that they probably couldn't have sold. Uh, we do work with Farm to School. We were fortunate to receive a Cup Care grant uh, during 2020, so we were able to give many grants to farmers markets to cover the increased cost of running a market during COVID. And on the local level, we work with um, we work with an organization called Buy Fresh by Local, trying to get consumers engaged in local food and food products, supporting local food businesses. And we're pleased to be working with Kane County on the Chicago Regional Food System Fund grant that we received recently. We also work at the national level. Uh, we're um, also working with Farmers Market Coalition to celebrate National Farmers Market Week this year, which is the first week of August. Um, we, we will talk about the benefits of promoting farmers markets uh, to anybody that will listen. I talk to the media, write articles, whatever. Uh, but we also try and stand in the gap for farmers markets, trying to address the barriers to success. For example, I think Steve just mentioned the one bill that was passed in this recent legislative session that limits the fees that our farmers, uh, livestock producers um, have to pay to sell at a, a local farmers market. Our, those producers have to pay a fee in every county in which they sell and some counties were charging fairly high fees and made a cost prohibitive, especially for our egg producers. You have to sell a whole lot of five to six dollar dozen eggs to um, pay for the fee. So we are seeing an absence of those types of products and markets. So we do stand in the gap there trying to work with our state level partners to come up with creative solutions to some of these barriers. Um, we also worked with the expanding the cottage food bill. Uh, as you'll see, as you may have noticed on our first slide, that was actually an area this last year that we provided a lot of professional development and training in because now these new opportunities with um, expanding the cottage food law. Next. Next slide. So why farmers markets? Well, they do offer the opportunity for direct-to-consumer sales. Direct-to-consumer sales means that there's no middleman. And so uh, in a traditional food system, the supply chain means that all the different hands that touch that food, um, the farmer typically takes home 17 cents out of every dollar. But in direct-to-consumer sales, where the transaction is between the customer and the, the farmer or vendor, um, a dollar of that dollar goes back home uh, with that producer, which we find to be really, really important. Um, COVID really taught us a couple things. One is we love farmers markets. They're great community events, love to go to them. But when COVID hit and there were really strong hiccups in the food supply chain, we realized that farmers markets are really about food access, making sure that all of our communities have access to uh, healthy, nutritious, de nutritionally dense food uh, was a really key point. And so um, that, along with food aggregation, bringing a wide variety of products to one place at one time, making it easier for the community to um, have access to food. We know that there are a number of communities where there are no grocery stores and that the farmer's market plays a really key role in providing food access. Um, there is a positive health impact with farmers markets. They offer very nutritious, healthy products to the community. Uh, many of our markets also accept, like I said, the link or the SNAP dollars and offer even matching programs for that. But one of the other things that's also really emerged is how much farmers markets are business incubators. If you think about it, it's relatively easy to rent a table or a stall may not be terribly expensive and it's a good beginning space for someone that wants to bring a product to market maybe it's produce maybe it's a cottage food a whole wide range of products that are available and through that opportunity getting your name out seeing what works seeing what doesn't we've seen 
Um, this has been a business incubator. Many of our vendors have actually become brick and mortar stores, or in addition, um, in addition to becoming brick and mortar, may have then used the farmer's market to launch themselves into additional uh, market channels. Maybe they've gone more to wholesale, farm to school, farm to food bank, all these other market channels that are available to them. The economic impact is significant. We do know that farmers markets bring people to the community. There's something called a sticky dollar, which means I come to your community on my way in and my way out, I spend money, and that money goes to your community directly. But then there's also um, a multiplier that USDA tells us that is now a dollar and 71 cents for every dollar cent spent at a farmer's market returns that dollar 71 to the community so that it's bringing um, income to the community and it tends to be that money that is generated through farmers markets stays local there is a three times greater chance that that money is going to stay local if it was uh, past hands at a farmers market obviously it's good for the community and we've also seen that it certainly supports uh, the local food system and farms uh, and here in Illinois, we'd love to see that grow. Um, most recent statistic I read said that we import about 97% of our food. And we'd love to see anytime people are spending money on food for it to be local food, uh, whether it's a food bank, a restaurant, whomever, so that farmers markets have that role in um, helping farmers and vendors begin and succeed and expand uh, so that they're making an impact in expanding the local food system. Next. Next slide, there we go. This is just uh, the map of the farmers markets that we have reported in Kane. As you can see, we have a number of them. And next slide. We also have a couple winter markets, but you also see that only the Elgin, Batavia and Aurora farmers market except Link, which um, we'd love to see all of our markets do. And next slide. With uh, link purchases, there's now a link match program so that a link user swipes their card for up to $25 for any link eligible or SNAP eligible food. And then they receive $25 in matching funds that can be used for fruits and vegetables. And then now we've gotten to a point where those those do, those link match dollars are universal. They can be used at any farmer's market that participates. So if you get your link match at Elgin, you can spend it at Aurora, doesn't matter. And you'll see that last, this is 2020, we're still waiting on 2021, but over 600 farms benefited from um, link and link match. And the economic impact was over $1.3 million. So we're continuing to work with our partners uh, to see more and more markets accepting LINK and getting the word out that those markets in fact do so that the community knows where to go to use their benefit dollars. And that's all I have. Any questions? Hopi, please. Oh, okay, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A ask away, Tom. Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, more of a statement than a question, I guess, but I'd like to direct it to whomever. Uh, it seems like we have uh, several uh, levels of uh, cooperation uh, as liaisons from the state. Now, in regards to Link, um, there is a. Uh, I'm going to be pretty fairly blunt. Don't don't be offended, please. Um, and I'm gonna I'm going to relate my point with story. So I'm on a construction site. We all earn big money uh, in as union employees doing what we do. I'm working with a uh, a couple of fellas, and uh, I uh, felt you know I felt uh, okay. Here's some young fellas, and I'll give them a ride to uh, to uh, Burger King. I give them a ride to Burger King, and. Uh, I says uh, I figured I'd just you know maybe buy him some lunch or something, and uh, oh no I got it. So he buys his lunch and he buys this and he buys that and he's just kind of scratching his chin. What you know what else can I get off the menu? And I says to him, Holy smokes! And he's just a skinny guy, and there's three of them. 
and uh, uh, all three of them ordered the same way. And um, these are union employees getting paychecks every week, building bridges, and uh, they uh, they paid with a Lynx card. And um, uh, it's uh, so the point is is that there's abuse in that system. And I'm going to ask anybody that's willing to listen to the question: Is there a means to uh, protect uh, the the taxpayers from this abuse? And um, and furthermore, as we uh, proceed into the future, and I made this uh, statement uh, three uh, three years ago, um, since uh, uh, my 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 original. Uh, experience, life's experience was that I worked at the Mercantile Exchange and I was a, uh, a floor trader and I was offered a seat at one time and I decided I was going to, I was going to live a substance living. And, uh, but I, I learned about the markets and I learned what the indicators were. I knew who the players were and uh, I was very well in tune to the system. And what we, what I warned the county was, is that we are in an ultra low interest rate environment that will be changing soon. There's indicators, major indicators that have changed. And now here we are today with 100% inflation from what it was uh, a couple years ago. And that's reverberating through the, uh, the, the farming industry. Uh, just the other day, corn hit $8 a bushel. Has never seen that price, and uh, and as far as I can tell, there's no end in sight. Um, the war in Ru- Ukraine is about having control of that breadbasket in Europe. That's what it's about. And not only does uh, Russia own have a majority of control of the oil, which produces the fertilizer, but they 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 want that land to have have control of that uh, of that food and uh for the people and this we've only seen the tip of the iceberg there was a lady that came to the county board meeting the other day and said you haven't seen anything yet because you just do what you're going to do and you just enjoy yourself because there's uh there's some serious uh business coming up on the horizon now i don't want to be a naysayer or a doom and gloomer but um but when it comes to when it comes to people screaming for food, which is the next order of business, if things progress as they are in the direction that they that it is, um, we will be uh, our money, our money in our pockets is going to become less, and it's going to become more useless uh, as as inflation as inflation marches on. So, if 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 the people that have earned livings and have paid the, the tax for the snap to go out and, and now are in the bread line and see that taking place when people are actually having a job and collecting snap uh, benefits that that's that's a uh, that's a that's a uh, that's a, uh, a a very um serious cocktail um i i i just want to say to the people mr chairman uh, that have access to the lawmakers and that go to the lawmakers on our behalf and ask them or tell them or, or make the point and statement that that there needs to be control on, on, these, uh, on these abuses. They are rampant. Um, some of the, uh, some of the uh, case scenarios... Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but folks are buying n- new cars. Um, they're, 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 they're subsidized phones, gas, and some of these uh, some of this bill some of this bill that goes to the taxpayer are 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 in are in excess of eighty thousand a year. And um, uh, there's taxpayers working uh, working uh, full time jobs for forty to pay the tax. So. Um, this is, this is coming to a head and I just wanted, it's fair warning. Um, I won't be in the position to, to make these, uh, absurd statements in a few months. And, um, uh, I just thought I, I feel responsible. I feel responsible for, 
for speaking my piece and saying that we need to do something. Now, as as far as you, now as far as uh, there's two other things. Sorry, um, that lady that uh, uh, spoke about her garden. There's uh, there's plowing bee clubs. There's they, these antique tractor people. They go out and they they they, they plow plots for just for the fun of it. You need to you need to contact some of those uh, tra- uh, antique tractor um, communities, and uh, they'll have their plowing bee right on your garden. You know, so uh, especially if it's more than uh, five acres or something like that. Um, we'll bring that little tractor out. That'd be fun. But uh, and then as far as uh, Mr. Arnold's concerned, I had a question for him earlier. Um, uh, I don't quite understand what the federal government. Uh, role is in um, in the production of ethanol, and, and when and if it can be produced or used or mandated for use. Um, as I'm hearing a little bit more and more about the potential of corn being used for ethanol, can can we touch base on that, Mr. Chairman, just on the ethanol aspect of uh, corn? You eight dollar corn is going to be tough to get in the ethanol. We're going to price ourselves out of that. This, uh, Tom, we have to move the meeting along. So I'll let you gonna, go. We're then. going to go over. So uh, we'll try to answer some of your questions uh, oh, offline. Oh, that's all right. I, 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 okay, that sounds great. Thank you. No, I, um, I. I'm sorry, I left a note in the chat. I'm. This is Tracy Kelsey. I, I need to go to another meeting. I'm happy to talk more about SNAP and LINK later, um, but thank you for having me. All right, thank you, Tracy. Okay, bye-bye. Um, Janice Hill. Yes, thank you. I'll be um, making a presentation on the matching mini grant program. And then there's a, a item under new business that uh, corresponds with that, which is a resolution supporting uh, my request and there we have it so um, this request today for a matching mini grant program is very similar to what you've considered for the compere mini grant and approved as well as the kane county board has approved the imac matching resolution for manufacturing grants so similar concept similar program there we go. Um, Janie mentioned in her presentation that um, she, the Illinois Farmers Market Association has received funding from the Chicago Regional Food System Fund. And uh, she partnered with us to apply for this funding. Um, and so we're very grateful to have such a, a wonderful partner. The regional fund just announced um, one and a half million dollars to 60 recipients for $25,000 match, $25,000 grants. And for in this particular case, the funds are specific to Kane County. And so there you have the announcement. I did notice just yesterday, they did make an, another announcement for grant funds because there is um, such a need as you've been hearing all morning um, for support for farms, farmers, farmers markets and uh, the food supply chain in general in response to the pandemic. So this particular grant is focused on the BIPOC community. That acronym stands for the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, and uh, focuses on, in this particular case, because we don't have very many people of color or Black farmers in Kane County, but we do have consumers, and uh, we do have farmers markets, and we do have community groups and community gardens that serve the BIPOC community. So ILFMA, receiving the grant will invite applicants that have farms that are owned or operated by BIPOC farmers. I think we have two according to uh, the last census. We also have um, the farmers markets that are selling or donating to the BIPOC community. You've heard a little bit about that today in Janie's presentations. The community groups and community gardens that teach and grow and serve the BIPOC community, which you heard about today as well, and any new programs that are focused for summer of 2022. These are um, all set um, for dollars that need to go out as quickly as possible 
there. So ILFMA will have a grant program specific to that. What we are looking today for from Kane County and the Growing for Kane program using economic dollars is a one for one match for that with the request that will be consistent with our uh, Growing for Kane policies, which are to encourage new programming, uh, create new farmers, more food grown, which is essential, and to grow the health and economy for Kane County. And also, which is so important for all the grants that we do, that uh, we take our lessons learned from conversations, data, and surveys with the participants so that we can build more technical resources moving forward. So it's a very simple process, as I mentioned, ILFMA will issue the grants to all the Kane County entities that are eligible, um, all that we, I just mentioned. And then once they have their eligibility list and they have their grants, if Kane County will approve this, then all of those eligible grantees would get a one-for-one -one match from Kane County using economic development dollars. We would bring that back to the Ag Committee for approval and then on uh, to the Kane County Board for final approval. Um, we are looking for a match up to $1,000 for each applicant and no more than $25,000 from economic development funds. And so uh, just a reminder, I know that um, we've talked a little bit about the importance of the food supply chain, farms, farmers, essential to our food supply chain, still necessary and um, solidified through uh, Governor Pritzker's executive order 2020-32, um, identifying our farmers markets in Illinois as essential infrastructure, which was critical during uh, the peak of the pandemic to keep those farmers markets open. And I thank Janie and ILFMA for the work that they did to make sure that that happened. That wasn't true in every state, but here in Illinois, we know that that is important. And obviously you heard all the data and stories about um, the fact that we still have a need for food and fresh food and the importance for that. You've heard that testimony today. Um, regarding the economic and health impact, just, just a reminder again, Janie touched on this. We know that there are there is an economic impact. This is not just a feel good program. This is true economic dollars in our communities, staying in our communities. Some, some places have gone ahead and done a very specific study in their location. The graphic on the left shows uh, Florida um, and money that's spent at a farmer's market and, and coming up with the exact dollars that is that are left in the community with local businesses and with the farmers. Um, and the two modeling tools that are used are the seed, um, model as, as well as implant, implant, which are two um, models that economic developers use to measure impact, economic impact. And then for our, for our program, of course, we've done a health impact assessment, which was the foundational document for our Growing for Cane Ordinance. So we know that uh, if people, if provided, people will eat healthy and nutritious locally grown food and they will, they'll have better health outcomes. So, so we know the purpose of, of health and locally grown food. And recently, um, the public uh, news, public radio news um, from U of I issued a report, and this is really interesting, it's a national report that said that black and people of color are not welcome and are not made to feel welcome in farmers markets. And it's very interesting because it does bring up the question of, who are farmers markets geared toward and are they reaching everyone? Now this was a national look, um, but I had to go back and think about, because I take pictures at our farmers markets all the time. I'm always out taking photos. And I thought, you know, is this really true? Is this, is this true here in Kane? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and Janie and I talked a bit about this, but I do know that with some of that grant funding, That'll be one of the questions that we ask, um, that ILFMA ask, and are we reaching through the marketing and education materials all members of the Kane County community, and is everyone made to feel welcome? You know, when I pulled stock photos of people of color and Black people, you can see in other parts of the country that, you know, 
rep better representation. So there's a way to grow this, um, making sure everyone feels welcome everywhere. And so those are some of the questions that we'll ask. And then also that will feed our technical resources going forward. And just more of those photos, not from Kane County, but thank you. Thank you to the board for and the committee for considering the request for the matching fund. Thank you for the Chicago Regional Food Fund for granting ILFMA the grant and thanks to ILFMA for all the work. So I hope that you consider the matching funds from the Economic Development Fund. And a reminder, which is really important too, the census of ag is coming up and for any of the farmers that have not received their paperwork, just to uh, reach out to get some of that paperwork, you'll be seeing us promote that as well. Any questions? And Mr. Arnold? I guess I, I have a question that might be more for Janie than for you, but if, if as you went through this, I understand this is for farms and farmers markets. So I assume that that's similar through the Illinois Farmers Market Association grant program, that that application is not exclusive to farmers markets. It will be, first of all, the geography will be for Kane County, right. or if you serve Kane County, because we do have some organizations that serve Kane County will also include not-for-profits and community groups, farmers. We have many farmers that grow for farmers markets that serve the BIPOC community. And right, so it's pretty inclusive and broad. Right. And then my, my second question, and again, this might be for Janie. Um, I assume that the grant application the grant period is open until the funds are spoken for, but is there is there a closing date? Well, well, ILFMA, we've applied for those funds. We received the they they will receive the funds. It was approved. So I the goal is to get those funds out as quickly as possible. So I think Janie can tell you when she plans to announce the application. And, but I know the idea is to get them out as quickly as possible because people need to use those funds to support their gardens in the summer, this summer. That's the goal. And then the third question, um, which, is, which, is, which is more of a, a, a question about um, education about the opportunity is, is uh, and again, it's a question for you and for Janie as to whether or not we can get an informational meeting scheduled, um, uh, both for farmers market operators and for our members that, that serve those markets. Janie, I don't wanna say yes, I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> yes, I'll say yes. Yes, that would be a great idea to spread the word about the opportunity and get the information out as quickly as we can. Thank you. Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Hill, I, I do have one question. I was writing some notes when you were speaking, so I may have missed it. But the grant is asking for 18,000, but our matching funds will max out at 1,000 per applicant up to 25,000. There's a discrepancy between the 18 and 25. How is that being handled? Oh, yeah. I'll let Mark answer that. Sure. Yeah. So the uh, working with with Janie, uh, one of the beauties of this for us, like other matching grant programs, is someone else is administering the grant. In this case, it's the uh, ILFMA uh, and and Janie. So uh, what we the intent is that we want to match um, a, up to a thousand dollars for every recipient that they give a grant to. Uh, some of the twenty five thousand dollar grant that they get. Um, they'll need to spend on administration costs and you know, providing the grant administration. Um, they're still figuring that out. So um, I think for the, the case of just moving this through uh, to, uh, to uh, amend the resolution to ask for up to, up to 25,000. So um, it'd be a thousand dollar match for each recipient. Um, going up to 25,000 just gives us the maximum flexibility to work with whatever is left um, you know, after administration costs. 
So once again, maybe I'm not following. Should we amend this to up to 25,000 then instead of 18? Yes, please. I'd like to make that amendment. Well, I guess first we have to move it. That would be down below. Yes. Okay, we'll wait. You have to remember now. I will. Okay, now <laughs> we have to move on to Matt Tansley. He's got the next two things. Yes, uh, I'm actually gonna pass the first item off to Mark to discuss the county code update. All right. He's gonna, he's gonna cover that. Yes, and uh, Blair's got a presentation. So this is uh, part of the uh, request that all committees are doing to look at the language in the county code for their uh, committee. Um, I think you saw a draft of this last month. If you can advance the slide one for me. Oh, thank you. So I think this is the uh, language that you had uh, seen before. Um, re requested action would be to come to consensus. Now, since uh, uh, the uh, packet went out, there's some discussion on some additional language uh, that would uh, add the uh, Animal Control Department to be reporting to this committee as opposed to public health. So uh, uh, Matt uh, put together an, an additional slide, alternate revision. Um, it's the same as what you had seen before for this committee, uh, but it would add this committee shall be supported by the staffs so of the Development Community Services Department, the Department of Environmental and Water Resources, and the Kane County Animal Control Department. This committee shall also have jurisdiction over the Kane County Animal Control Department and the director of said office. So uh, this would um, move, uh, add an additional department uh, to uh, um, report to the Agriculture Committee and it would give this committee uh, jurisdiction over the, uh, the uh, activities of that uh, animal control and the director. So, um, it's out here for your discussion this morning. Okay, thank you. And then Matt, do you wanna, wanna carry on? You have another uh, uh, growing cane update. Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to give my presentation, but given the hour, I'd also like to give the committee the option. If so, I could give my presentation next, next month. month for expediencies, okay. but I'd be fine either way. Mr. Sergis, I want you to know we've gone over by 15 minutes. <laughs> um, is there any other? Oh, we have a resolution approving Illinois Farmers Market matching mini grants program in Kane County. The wording you're going to add? Uh, Leonard so moves and we'll second it and then we'll amend the resolution. Okay, that's right. You move it? And I do. Mr. Foz seconds. How would you like to amend this? Yes, I would like to amend this to uh, increase the amount from 18,000 to up to $25,000. Five seconds. Is there any discussion on that? So we're ready to vote. So we're voting, vote on the amended motion, moving it up to $25,000. Oh, cool. Mr. Hello. Chairman, Alan? No, Alan. Okay. We're going to vote. I thought this was the discussion part. Excuse me. So it's, it's, we don't need a discussion. Go ahead and vote. Alan, we got to get these people out of here. They got all these pictures of showing food. It's got me hungry. I don't know about the rest of you. Go ahead. Brown. Brown, yes. Fraz. Fraz, yes. Kopi. Leonard? Kopi, yes. Sorry. Leonard? Leonard, yes, with the amendment attached. So this is a motion as amended. Okay, great. Yes. Alan? Aye. Alan, aye. Kenyon? Aye. Now, there's any other discussion? We have to move to a close. Oh, we have a, do you want a unanimous consent to put reports on file? Leonard moves. And Mr. Fraud seconds. There's no executive session for today's prize. Since I forgot, I was going to bring honey. But um, Mr. Arnold has got Kane County Farm Bureau Foundation Mother's Day quilt raffle. 
and its tickets are five dollars each or five for 20. So I will offer you two tickets to the person who can answer um, the, how many farmers markets are there in Illinois? Whole bunch. Three, three hundred and sixty-eight. See what? I thought you said three hundred and thirty plus. Plus, okay, we get a different question. Okay, <laughs> that's what I wrote too. So, this we had a young lady talk about her garden, <coughs> Michelle Durate. What is her garden's name? Oh. Batavia Community Garden. Stand up. <laughs> Cover your chest. <laughs> Garden Glory. Ho Ho Garden. The Ho Ho Garden. Garden Glory. Is that is that good enough? Glory Gardens. Garden. That's Close it. Enough. Mr. Leonard gets it. You get two tickets for the quilt, and now we need a motion to adjourn. Leonard Mr. Fraz, Leonard seconds. All in favor? Okay. Aye.